The search started the night of May 26th, a Sunday, when Colin Finnerty went missing in the woods here, amid towering white pines and shrubby scrub oak trees and owls and white-tailed deer. By Monday morning, helicopters circled overhead as cadaver dogs combed through the brush below. By that Tuesday, the search party had ballooned to include 13 officers from Lake County, 22 reserve officers, almost 100 local volunteers, and so many friends and family members that the assembled lost count. They fanned out in small groups, separated by 100 yards, walking in the same direction, crossing square mile sections of the Weber Township grid. Some waded through waist-high swamps, others fought through dense foliage. As darkness approached on Tuesday, there was one final section the authorities planned to check that day. Finnerty had been missing for nearly 48 hours. The group closest to the nearest road, near enough to hear cars purr as they drove past, assumed it would never find him as it stamped through backyards, past trailers and huts and cabins and deer blinds. Among that group stood Chuck Martin, Finnerty's football coach at Grand Valley State, now the offensive coordinator at Notre Dame, and Kurt Ains, the quarterback Finnerty succeeded. The group pushed through branches into a clearing. Ains' wife, Lindsay, was between Martin and her husband. Oh my God, she said rising. Oh my God. Martin's gaze shot in that direction, and there lay Finnerty, face down, arms at his side, wearing olive waders and camouflage jacket. It was 7.40 p.m. Lindsay Ains dropped to her knees. Her husband fought the urge to turn Finnerty over and embrace him. As the police rushed in, the group slogged back to the road. Is this really happening? Kurt Ains asked over and over again. One search had ended. Another, the search for answers, had just begun. So little about Finnerty's death made sense. Here was perhaps the most successful quarterback in college football history, a three-time national champion who was crowned the Division II Player of the Decade by one website. He was 30, married, the father of two children, one age two, the other three months. One week earlier, the family had gathered for his daughter's baptism. On Memorial Day weekend, he accompanied his wife's family on vacation. None of it made sense. How he complained of headaches and restless sleep in the days before he disappeared. How he went fishing by himself. How he ended up dead, not much more than a hundred yards from a road, out in the open, about half a mile west of where he docked his pontoon boat. His last two phone calls proved most haunting. One was to his wife, the other from his brother-in-law. Family members said that in both, Finnerty sounded panicked. He said he was uncomfortable. He said he ran into two men on the Baldwin River. He thought they might be following him. Finnerty was 6 feet 2 inches. He weighed about 240 pounds. He ran to fights, not away from them. Friends called him Superman and Rambo, and yet his final known actions did not square with the life he lived. Here was a man widely described as fearless, whose last known words were spoken in fear. To find the Lake County Sheriff Department, drive north from Grand Rapids, then west on US Route 10. Drive past the billboard advertising year-round fund, past the closed restaurants and boarded up houses, past the tin cup trailhead, the shrine of the pine sign, and the cattail cafe. On the last Friday in May, a couple came to report a stolen butterfly sign. Lost dog posters hung from the wall next to homemade bail bond advertisements. Dennis Robinson, the undersheriff, settled behind his desk after lunch surrounded by trophies with dog figures on top, which he had accumulated for canine training. The first call about Colin Fernity came in on May 26th around 10.30 p.m. Fernity's family had dropped him off at the Bray Creek State Forest Campground a few hours earlier. When they returned to retrieve him, his boat was there. He was not. People end up lost in those woods on a regular basis, Robinson said, a few times annually. Normally, folks will walk around for a day or so, and then we'll bring them out, and they're fine except for some scratches and bug bites, Robinson said. This was not a normal outcome. 
Lake County officials called the state police to marshal resources. Three officers walked the nearby creek and rivers, poking in the holes underneath the banks. Helicopters flew over an area of 16 square miles. Officers found a vest, though relatives did not believe it belonged to Finnerty. They also found footprints a mile and a half north of where he was dropped off. They had a phone company ping his cell phone, and the results came back as far as three miles south and five miles north. Still no answers, only questions. The family lingered on phone calls. The pain Finnerty reported in his left arm and jaw, the hour or two he slept each night that weekend. He always slept longer than anyone else. Sometimes they called him Mr. Nap. Finnerty answered his phone for the last time at 9.36 p.m. Sunday. The police said the call lasted about 20 seconds. I don't know where I am, he told his brother-in-law, according to family members. This brought to mind an incident from December 2011, the other time Finnerty's actions could not be explained, the only time his older brother, Tim, had ever seen him scared. Finnerty was out in Detroit with co-workers. He thought he was being followed. In a fit of paranoia, he drove to Tim's home in Grand Rapids, more than 150 miles away. Nobody was behind him. He was not himself, Tim said. The family says it does not blame football for Finnerty's death. Some even resent the speculation that it played a role. But his siblings do wonder, after all the stories about head injuries, after all the research into concussion and their cumulative effect, especially with the way Finnerty played football, the way he craved contact and hit injuries from the trainers, Grand Valley State sent Finnity's medical records to the authorities. He had one diagnosed concussion in his redshirt freshman season when a defender wrestled him down from behind and his head bounced off the ground. After the game, he stared blankly at his brothers, eyes vacant. When Finnerty disappeared, Grand Valley State sent a bus of coaches and players and staff to look for him. Perhaps as many as 300 people came in all, until eventually the authorities had to turn some away. Older alumni set up a tent for food and water. Mostly, though, they waited. That was frustrating. Tensions surfaced with the police, who were overwhelmed by the number of volunteers who needed to keep the areas clear for the dogs and helicopters. The volunteers stood more than they searched. Tim Jr. rode with his father around the woods. His mother called. Cullen's dead, she said. His father drove a hundred more yards and pulled over. Both men climbed outside and fell to the ground. I haven't stopped sobbing since, Tim Jr. said. Finnerty's body went to the Spectrum Health Butterworth Hospital in Grand Rapids. An autopsy ruled out a heart attack. Robinson said there was no indication of foul play, no bruises, no cuts, no answers. He expected more test results that week. On Thursday, though, he sent an email that said, There is no new information at this time. They set up a memorial trust fund for his children, but they did not find the answers they most sought, not immediately. The initial autopsy was inconclusive, the toxicology report negative. There was no explanation for how he died, nor was there one in the week that followed. His death remained a mystery, even as it revealed a fuller portrait of his life. I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever know. Alright guys, thanks for checking out another ASMR conspiracy with another 411 missing case uh, although this uh, Coleman Finnerty case in my opinion isn't exactly uh, as mysterious as it may seem from the outside uh, that was some of a condensed reading I kind of gave. There's a actually more in-depth article in the New York Times if you'd like to go in there and read it. I'll uh, link that in the description below. But it goes into some more backstory of uh, Collins' uh, football career. And he had a penchant for uh, playing a bit of a hard-hitting style. And uh, just the things that they describe his play as and also the story in there about how he got paranoid and just drove 150 miles to his brother-in-law's house because he thought he was getting followed uh, it just seems like a, a case of CTE to me 
now I could be wrong uh, maybe he was being followed who knows uh, but I just think when you think of a guy who's 30 years old and played football his whole life took a lot of hits to the head uh, possibly a lot of uh, a lot of injuries that he'd never reported just because there's a lot of that you know Iron Man type of uh, vibe when you're in the football uh, environment you know you don't want to say that you're hurt you want to keep playing so even if there are medical records of his concussions they may not be full records if you see what I'm saying here so that being said, I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, though this is a tragic event for uh, Mr. Fennerty, I think uh, CTE is the most likely cause. And that would probably put this out of uh, contention for any more mysterious conspiracies or possible, you know inner in the woods killers or something like that I, I just feel like this is a guy who had a disease and was on his own left to his own devices out in the wild and just succumbed to uh, nature uh, well guys again thanks for sticking around and listening to me so if you have any other questions about this case or if you have any other topics besides missing 411 maybe any other conspiracies or something you'd like to hear about just let me know in the comments below be sure to like and subscribe to the channel I'm trying to grow as much as I can and put more content out there for you thanks again you guys and have a good day